that. Living Waters presents On the Box. Hey, welcome to On the Box. This is the box, and we're on it. <laughs> this is Ray Comfort. I'm Eddie Roman, and we're here to talk about uh, evangelism and stuff, right? Stuff, yeah. That's what we yeah. do. God, Jesus, and the Bible, and things like that. Yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, Ray, how was your last time out uh, at Huntington Beach open air preaching? Um, I thought it was going to be pretty horrible because it was a cold day and, and uh, couldn't pull a crowd, and uh, it was starting to rain, mm. and that doesn't help. And um, Especially when you got, like, paper and money and... and <laughs> <laughs> I was giving away 180 DVDs, okay. and uh, I really like doing that. The shrink wrap. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're shrink wrapped, okay. and uh, they did get wet little bubbles on them. But um, people started stopping, and I got a good crowd. And then it started to rain, and the crowd didn't leave. So I was, I was delighted. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't a massive crowd, but they stayed and listened. And, and I don't mind preaching. I preach on no if it rains, but I don't, I don't mind if it rains. I don't mind standing in the rain, getting wet for the gospel. But um, people don't usually stay, so that was, uh, that was a blessing to have them stay. I'm saying, uh, um, what's the number one killer drive in the U.S.? I'm just asking trivia. Yeah, yeah and the, thi the good thing about it is um, people don't normally get prizes. They don't win. Most people don't win stuff. And so they win a DVD, and I've never had anyone win something and then discard it. Huh. They clutch it in their hand. Now, if I'm just going around giving out DVDs, I say, yeah, I'll take it, I'll take it. But because they win it, they value okay. it. Yeah. So they uh, prove they answered a question. Yeah. So maybe it's a key to giving out uh, 180 DVDs. Just go up to people and ask them trivia and say, <laughs> you say, what's your name? John, you won a DVD. It's right. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you do that. That's been yeah, it is. It's a funny one. It's not original. It's not. No, no. I didn't make that, that up. It's okay. It's funny, yeah. though. Yeah, it is funny. I love it. <laughs> you know what? I was out... Uh, witnessing out in Riverside, uh -huh. and I ran into, I didn't literally run into them, but I, I came across a group of about five, uh, five guys in their late 20s, early 30s, and got to talking to them. They were handing out millions and all kinds of Living Waters tracks and stuff, and turns out they went through, they, they, they go to Grace Community Church, not affiliated with John MacArthur's church, but in, in Riverside, and they did a basic training course seven years ago wow. on a Friday night, and they've been going out in the streets every Friday ever For since. For seven years. And they still call it pie. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> yeah, I've forgotten what I even... <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It's a uh, prayer... Uh, intercession, intercession? No, no prayer is the same as intercession. Pizza. It is pizza. <laughs> <laughs> pizza, I could get pizza and prayer messed up. <laughs> <laughs> pizza, intercession, and evangelism. Pizza? That's yes. right. And so this is this is a. Uh, they still got the pie going. They still got the pie rolling. Oh, that's it's amazing. Going. So it was neat. It was neat to, to uh, you know, find was, a little slice of life like that a out there. Little slice of pizza. Yeah. It was uh, it was really encouraging to see these guys who just been faithful this whole time, and uh, still going at it. So. Yeah, it when we were start preaching outside the courts about five or six years ago, we thought it's all over. But that started people preaching outside courtrooms and outside yes. DMVs all over the place. So yeah. that's very encouraging. And it's it's just neat because I mean you wonder how many little groups like this there are all over America and the world that mm -hmm. are that are just you know got going a, a while ago and they're they're still going mm -hmm. at it. So to all of you out there who are doing it, keep going. Have a yeah. slice of pizza, Andre. Thank you. Okay. We're on a plate. Yes. Um, all right. We're going to look at a little uh, 180 kind of uh, pro-life thing. There is a list that just came out a while ago. The top pro-life celebrities. Okay. We're going to look at, uh, can we get the, the first photo up here? It's, it's off a, a website, um, liveaction.org. And a couple of the pro-life celebrities. So on the bottom there, you got the, the number one guy. It's Tim Tebow. Wow. You know Tim Tebow, Tebow is, right? Tim yeah, he's a great <laughs> baseball player. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I, I know you got his book a while ago, but yes. I don't know. Above that, you'll notice Justin player. Bieber. Mm. You know, know I, I called him Justin Beaver Justin for Bieber. years. <laughs> My granddaughter says, no, nah, it's not Beaver. <laughs> it's Bieber. Well, on the same, on the same list, uh, um, you'll, you'll notice if you could put that picture on again. Uh, okay, there's Justin Bieber at the top. And on the same list, if you go to the next, next picture, we have uh, Kathy Ireland. She's about to come up here. That's not. There's Kathy with the sunglasses. So, um, <laughs> Kathy Ireland down at the bottom, and also on the list we have 
none other than Ray Comfort. Our own, <laughs> and he's a celebrity now. That's why he has sunglasses on. So uh, he's going to be. Uh, you know, how does it feel? Did you see my agent before you put this up here? <laughs> how does it? Feel, how does it feel to be on the same list with Justin Bieber? Beaver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know. It's kind of strange. <laughs> it really is. So you're a pro-life yeah. celebrity. Yeah, it's just a bit weird. Can I have your autograph? No. Okay. No, it's a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the good, the good thing is... That's just going to get more notoriety for 180, yes, right? Yes, yeah, it is. It's wonderful. So I thank God for it, even though it's a little embarrassing. Well, maybe you'll get to d be the headlining group after Justin Bieber someday. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I should sing a song or something. You should. You know what? That <laughs> reminds me. We're working on the Prague episode, and so it, or actually Vienna. Mm -hmm. We're just finishing up Prague. We're actually going to show you something fr from the show in a little bit. But it, the Vienna episode, um, you know, Vienna's all about the country is, is a lot of composers come from there. It's all about music and stuff. And I heard that one of the composers um, was inspired by... <laughs> <their> <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> box. <laughs> <By their laughs> is that what you're building up to? Yes. Oh, boy. It was a stupid joke that I heard <laughs> years ago yes, where Beethoven was. said to his secretary, you inspire me. And she said... <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the stupid joke. And Eddie keeps bringing it up in public, and he's done it see, today. See. You know, when we're in Vienna, yes, our sound man uh, uh, whistled the Blue Danube to me. That's what I it heard. It was just beautiful. We were yeah. sitting having pizza one night in Vienna, late at night. You are having pie. Pie, yeah. Okay. And there was pizza intercession and, and evangelism. And he just started quietly whistling. I said, that's beautiful, because he can whistle really well. And he whistled probably for... Six or seven minutes nonstop because yeah. the Danube is quite long and it's it's just a beautiful tune. I love it. Well, he's an amazing guy. He actually does voices for cartoons. Mickey and Mouse different and things yeah, like what's that. his name? Yeah. Tony. Tony, that's right. Yes. Yeah, he's a good guy. Our sound man. He's great. Good sound man. <laughs> yes, he's very sound. Okay, I was looking at something, but segment two: nativity <laughs> uproar. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's professional. Yeah, <laughs> very powerful. You, uh, okay, who wrote this? Um, the nativity uproar. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to read a letter here. 5,000 Christians attend a rally to support nativity at Texas Courthouse. Okay? That's the headline. This is a headline. Okay? This is a news article we got from uh, Sunday, December 18th. Okay? This was uh, in the news <laughs> somewhere. It was all over the news. Every news. The CNN it was on. It says, an estimated 5,000 people showed up for a rally Saturday in Athens, Texas to support a nativity, di a nativity display in opposition to an atheist group that had requested the court, the country, the county, and the country remove the display. Mm -hmm. So there's a nativity scene up. This courthouse, this atheist group from another state, starts calling this this courthouse and saying you got to remove it and breaking all these. It's Dan Barker and his boys up in Wisconsin. Was he barking at them again? Yeah, he is. He's a little watchdog for the church. Mm. Uh, Dan Barker and I have crossed swords for many years. Do you know the first time we ever crossed swords was probably about ten years ago when email kind of first started getting underway in a big way, and I emailed him and said something to him that made him email me back and say if I ever contacted him again via email, he would see my service provider and have my email shut down. I didn't even know what that meant then. <laughs> But it sounded scary. It sounded scary, because I said to him, so you were a Christian for 19 years, you faked it for 19 years, I said, Judas only lasted for three years, you did 19 <laughs> years, cool. and that really got the knife in. But here, here's a, here's a uh, Christian minister in the pulpit, not knowing the Lord for 19 years, mm. and writing Christian songs, and getting royalties out of it, and that's called hypocrisy. Yeah. And no one likes being called a hypocrite. No. Uh, but he uses that in his argument against Christianity. I was a Christian for 19 years. Right. So, so did you know the Lord? No. I just I thought I did, but I didn't. Well, he didn't. And so he now, he's, now he's, he's on the hunt against nativity scenes all over America. And so, so anyway, he, he, he starts going after this, this courthouse. And it gets out of the newspaper and... 5,000 people, if you want to um, put the next uh, photo there up, 5,000 people show up to uh, protest this. That's what know? Dan Barker did. Isn't that wonderful? He gets all these Christians to I, I called the minister that's running. I don't know if I've got his name there, but he's a very nice guy. He loves our ministry. And uh, he said he had never before, oh, look at that. There's Justin Bieber. He was there too. <laughs> he never before had he seen such unity in that area. He wow. said... He said, this is the Bible Belt. You can't get two groups of churches to agree on anything. He says, but we got 73 pastors come together for a meeting about this nativity 
protest thing. And then to have 5,000 people turned out, it's just wonderful. So I said to him, what we would like to do is send a team in there and to uh, Athens, to the local college, to the high school. So we've got a team going in there in January. And uh, we sent 20... 180 courses to 20 of the top churches in that area to train up wow. their people. So anywhere Dan Barker goes with his whining and barking about Christian symbolism, we're going to contact the churches in that area. We're doing Santa Monica. He just whined about something there. It's a group of atheists. You know, you've got to feel sorry for those atheists. They've got nothing better to do. They just sit around well and think. Well, their purpose in life is to tell people there's no purpose in life. That's it. Yeah. And they just, uh, they just whine. So they're doing a, a great service to the church. Remember when Saul of Tarsus... Um, when he created havoc in the church, it says the disciples went everywhere preaching the word. And it reminds right. me of an incident that I had back in New Zealand probably about, oh, it must be 30-something years ago. I had this friend of mine, his name was Wally. He was uh, open-air preaching with me. He'd, I think he came in for about two years of the 12 that I was there. And one day I came in and Wally had taken the initiative and got my ladder out of the ch church building, put it up, and he was preaching to a crowd of about oh, 80 people. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. And as I was standing in the crowd watching him, I noticed some peace marchers came up to him. They were having a protest on the other side about peace on the other side of the square. And they said to him, uh, please stop. And I thought, what are they doing? They've stopped him preaching. So I ran down and they said, look, we're preaching peace. You're preaching peace. We're preaching the same message. So they said to Wally, you stop while we have a uh, rally. And I said, excuse me. Uh, I said, we're preaching peace with God. You're preaching peace without God. Different kingdoms. You do your thing over there. We'll do thing our thing. I said, take it away, Wally. And he started preaching again. Well, they came back and they were violent. They were going like this, peace march, just trying to get Wally to stop preaching. They stopped him from speaking. Um, so the moment they stopped him from speaking, I felt indignation come in my heart. And I jumped up and began preaching to the crowd. And they ran across to me and stopped me speaking. And as soon as I was stopped speaking, Wally burst into flames. And they ran back to him. And really, you don't realize the Holy Spirit, the fire of God dwells in you until the winds of persecution come against you. And that's oh. what happened with the early church, with Saul of Tarsus and other times. You cannot stop Christianity. Yeah. You, you, winds of persecution come to it, it's going to stir up the flames. And that's exactly what happened in Athens. 5,000 Christians came out to stand up for one little nativity scene. God wow. bless them, and may it become more than a protest. May it move from protest to preaching, because that's the power of God to salvation. You know, I, it, that's that's such a great point. With uh, persecution, really does stir people up. I, I just think of my own son. There were times when I, you know, want to take my kids out and try to, you know, see if they want to hand out tracks and stuff, and you know, they don't want to. It's it's they're fe fearful, awkward, awkward, whatever. And one time we were at a, a football game, just you know, watching one of my sons play football. My other son. We just hanging out with the other kids, and he comes and asks me for a tract, and he goes and gives it to this other kid he just met. Well, the kid didn't want it, and I just see my my son walking back towards me, just with his head down, <laughs> just kind of you know, just really really sad. And he comes over and he's like, oh, "He didn't want it," and and uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit, of, but man, that same son, he loves going out handing out tracts now because mm -hmm. he it's kind of something he, you know, he he saw the importance of it, he tried to do it. He, he got some rejection, but he, he tried again, and now he, you know, likes to do it even more. So I, I think uh, we make a mistake a lot of times by, you know, not allowing ourselves and even our kids to be put in situations where we're afraid they're going to get some persecution. You want to protect them. You, protect you know, them. I remember Absolutely. I saw Daniel, my son, when he was about 14, give someone a tract, and they rejected him. Mm -hmm. I saw them go like that, and I fell over right across and saying, you take that. <laughs> But I didn't, of course, because I'm a Christian. Right. But do you get used to rejection? Um, not really. I, I think, if anything, <coughs> you build up maybe a, a sense of humor or something to where you're just able to kind of <laughs> laugh it off. And maybe you're still <coughs> sad. But um, it definitely helps when you, when you have friends you're out there on the streets with and you know, because everybody can <laughs> be rejected together all at once. Well, you know what I find? I find a thousand people can take a gospel tract but when one person rejects it, I forget about the thousand. Absolutely. All you do is think about, oh, I want to go home. No, really. Um, it? But it, we never get used to it. No. But Easy's got a good thing. He, he counts as rejections. Oh. And he says, he's if he can get seven rejections. Or it might be Mark. I'm not sure which it's one. Mark. It's Mark. Mark Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he gets but yeah, a he, lot of yeah, them. Yeah, he gets a lot of them. But yeah, he, he tries to get as many rejections as he can. So that he sort of says, well, I've got tonight's lot of rejections. That's great. So he has to give out more tracks to get that many rejections. No, that's so true. Even within a given night of witnessing, you might go out and have 
just some amazing conversations with people, but you're always just going to remember the one person who just, you know, said rejected no. you or didn't want to hear it. So Arnold Schwarzenegger said that to me once. He did? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Didn't he? Wasn't he afraid of your... Uh, no, no, he was, that's why he was terrified. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, celebrity is a powerful thing. That's and, true. And <laughs> when I saw him walking towards me with his wife, well, his ex-wife, Maria Shriver, I forgot all my, um, you know, you never approach someone and just give them a tract. Right. You, you'd say, hi, how are you, or something. And I could have said, you know, I like the Terminator. I didn't actually say the Terminator, right. so I couldn't say that. But I said, um, um, and I just helped him. He just said, no, like that. <laughs> And I thought... That scared me when you just said yeah, it. Yeah, well, uh, coming from a... <laughs> That's a s you are a celebrity. And, uh, yeah, and it's so true. I just didn't give him a track because he said no. But yeah, I've always remembered that one. But it was funny because Arnold and I had a conversation. It was very short. Mm -hmm. His word was no, but I just asked me on to track. So we're buddies. You did have a conversation with a celebrity. Yes. Celebrity to celebrity. <laughs> yeah, stop it. All right. Um, we have been working on 180 as if... Uh, you didn't know that, but we've, you know, that's kind of been uh, what this ministry has been very much focused on for the last... We have been pregnant for uh, nine months. Yes. Well, we gave birth a while ago, too. Yes. But even the... After birth. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't going to say <laughs> it, but you, you said it. So um, so we've been just focused on that, that, you know, some people are getting the sense of what whatever happened to the way of the master. Well, the way of the master oh, is... Oh, I remember that program. Yes. Yes. It's, it's uh, back on track. We're going to release the Prague episode pretty soon. Um, it's going through some final color correction and sound mixing and, and things like that. And then we got the, the Vienna wor uh, episode that we've already started on. But right now I wanted to give a little uh, glimpse of the Prague episode. This is a segment of Easy uh, talking about evangelism. And, he, and he's talking about an aspect of ev evangelism that we kind of don't think of um, a whole lot because it has to do with evangelism in, in, in the church and, and kind of how an evangelist can be you know, really, really lift it up, and then he's kind of useless after that. So mm. anyway, let's go ahead and, and watch this, a little this segment on uh, Easy and the Fish. When was the last time you had a conversation with someone specifically to win them to Christ? As Christians, we need to get into the habit of preaching the gospel to those around us. Unfortunately, many churches are filled with people who don't do much when it comes to evangelism. So come along now and hear the parable of the Fishless Fisherman's Fellowship. The fishermen were surrounded by streams and lakes full of hungry fish. They met regularly to discuss the call to fish, the abundance of fish, and the thrill of catching fish. They got excited about fishing. Someone suggested that they needed a philosophy of fishing, so they carefully defined and redefined fishing. They also developed fishing strategies and tactics. They began research studies and attended conferences on fishing. Some traveled to faraway places to study different kinds of fish with different habits. A few even got doctorates in fishology. But no one had yet gone fishing. So a committee was formed to send out fishermen. As prospective fishing places outnumbered fishermen, the committee needed to determine priorities. A priority list of fishing places was posted on bulletin boards in all the fellowship halls, but still no one was fishing. A survey was launched to find out why. Most didn't answer the survey, but from those who did, it was discovered that some felt called to study fish, a few to furnish fishing equipment, and several to go around encouraging the fishermen. With so many important meetings, conferences, and seminars, they just simply didn't have time to fish. Now, Jake was a newcomer to the Fisherman's Fellowship. After one stirring meeting of the fellowship, he went fishing and caught a large fish. At the next meeting, he told his story and was honored for his catch. He was told that he had a special gift of fishing. He was then scheduled to speak at all the fellowship chapters and tell everyone how he did it. With all the speaking invitations and his election of the board of directors, Jake no longer had time to go fishing. But soon, he began to feel restless and empty. He longed to feel the tug on the line once again. So he canceled the speaking, he resigned from the board, and he said to a friend, hey, let's go fishing. That's exactly what the two of them did. And lo and behold, they caught fish. The members of the Fisherman's Fellowship were many. The fish were plentiful, but the fishermen were few. 
In Mark 1.17, Jesus says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. When it comes to evangelism, are you a fisherman who doesn't fish? If that's the case, don't be afraid to follow Jesus. You can trust him. He will make you a fisher of men. So Ray, my wife, when I showed her this video, her question was, was that about Ray? <laughs> is, that the, is that the story about Ray? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. It's actually a really famous uh, story from years and years ago mm -hmm. about the fishless fisherman. I don't know who wrote it. But it reminded me, I used to go fishing a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. I had this rich aunt, who I love very much, and her husband, who um, actually took me and my brother on a boat to Tahiti. Wow. That uh, was a beautiful big boat. I had a wonderful time in Fiji and Samoa. Okay, but she had this, this boat that I went fishing on lots of times when I was a kid. And uh, I love fishing. And you, you learn to, the principles of fishing and evangelism go so much hand in hand. You know the bait, you've got to attract the fish. And you can actually look on the ocean and tell where the fish are. Did you know that? Mm -mm. Well, do you know how to tell where fish are? Bubbles? No, not bubbles. Uh, <laughs> birds. Yeah, birds. The birds of the air. Yeah, birds of the air. Huh. Um, they'll hang around <coughs> because fish are often attracted. This is game fishing. Okay. Uh, big those big ones with the swords in the front. Yes. Uh, fish are often attracted to little fish, and the birds are often attracted to the uh, little fish also because the big fish want to get the little fish, and the birds want to get the fish. So if you see seagulls hanging around, it's uh, so often a shoal of fish. So that's where you go to fish. And birds in scripture are often a type of demons. So it's the dark places you often have to wow. go to to find a fish. And that's why we don't stay in the church. That's why we don't gather with Christians to evangelize. There's no point. You've got to go where, out where the fish are. So look right. for the birds. And often that's where you can be most affected in fishing. Actually, I don't like fishing. No. I like catching. Hey, I like that. Same with evangelism. <laughs> My wife, <coughs> Sue, who's only four foot eleven and a half, caught a barracuda once. She came on my rich aunt. You know what a barracuda is? Yeah, they've got the sharp teeth. Yeah, they're about this long and they're like... Just I shiny fish. I saw on the Discovery Channel once. Oh, you watch the Discovery <laughs> Channel. That <laughs> just the one that's time. That's painful. Those shows. The way they look at the Bible and say, D "Did Jesus really exist?" and stuff like that. And I get annoyed. I never watch those programs. I hate the Discovery Channel. But don't be kidding. Anyway, uh, it was a barracuda, and that what they do is uh, when they take your hook, they go right to the bottom. Some fish just fight. Some uh -huh. go right to the bottom. <coughs> and it's the same with evangelism. Sometimes you're witnessing to someone and they'll take the hook, but they'll try and drag you down. Mm. And you just got to be strong and pull them up. Even if you're a little person like my wife, she pulled on that barracuda. So that's what you got to do is use your muscle. She was the little fisherwoman who could. The little fisherwoman who could. That sounds like a little book for kids. The yes. Fisherwoman like the who could. Cartoon we just showed. <coughs> yeah. So there. That's great. No, when I first uh, started coming around the ministry, one of the things I, I noticed right away was just all how fishing is just such an analogy. You, you call the place where you go out to evangelize your fishing hole, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's like we're going on a fishing trip, and it's just, uh, mm -hmm. it's good. I like it. It's fishy. Mm. Okay. So, moving right along. Um, is that all we wanted to say about that video? It was a good like video. Was Easy was did a good job. He did. <coughs> all filmed in front of a green screen. Yeah. And it looks great. Who did the cartoons? Uh, Dirk Dallas did the animation. He's one of the guys who's who's been uh, just doing a lot of you know stuff on season four. And then Danny Cabella, who is a a, a, a uh, young woman who just graduated from a uh, art school, she did the actual illustrations. Okay. So she did the drawings, and then Dirk made him come to life. Move. And then Easy made himself come to life. Good. So it was good. good job. So yeah, it's a great great uh, great little story there. Um, Okay, we're gonna we got a little bit of time left. We're gonna look at a couple questions here. These questions I got them from the Living Waters Facebook page. Go on Facebook, <coughs> you, you type in Living Waters slash the way of the master in the search engine, and you will find the Living Waters Facebook page. And you can write something to Ray. Mm, nice. Yeah. Okay. So here's one of the questions um, from the Facebook page. It says, What scriptures can we use or how can we explain the way God is going to judge us on judgment day? What are some references that that explain he'll use the law. <coughs> Romans 12, sorry, Romans 2 verse 12. Okay. And uh, James 2 verse 12. Okay. You're probably wondering what they are, so I'll read them. I am. I actually got them in my Bible here. Okay. This is Romans 2 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. 
And as many as have been, so many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. I mean, what other standard is God going to use? He wrote the law with his finger in stone because it's permanent, it's eternal. The law is actually an, uh, just issuing from God's character and nature. There wasn't a time in, in eternity when God said what's right and what's wrong, let's think about it. No, hmm. that law is just part of God's character. Right. And that's the standard he's going to judge the world in righteousness. And the Bible speaks of a righteousness which is of the law. And then James 2.12, and it's almost disguised if you read it out of context. This is what it says. So speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. And often people say, oh, that must be grace, the law of liberty. Mm -hmm. No, the law brings liberty. In the same way, if you have a lawful game of football with no transgressions, you'll have a great free game. Huh. But if you have a lot of transgressions, the referee's going to be blown his whistle, stop, infringement, you know, have to have a penalty here and there. But if you've got a, 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 a law that's not infringed, you'll have absolute liberty. And the Bible calls it the, the perfect law of liberty, which it is, as we're told. But anyway, let me read it in context so people know that it's speaking of the law um, the moral law, for whoever shall keep the whole law, this is verse 10, and he has stumbled in one point, he's guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. That's the seventh and sixth commandment. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So they are the Bible verses to show us that's the standard we're going to be judged with on the day of judgment, and we infringe that law in spirit. Look with lust violation. You've committed adultery in your heart. Hate someone, violation. You've committed murder in your heart. And if only the world knew that, they would flee to the cross. And that's what we've got to try and get across by the help of God, with the help of God and by His grace to sinners, that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's the standard. And we're without excuse because that work, the work of that law has been written on our heart. We know it's wrong to murder and commit adultery and lie and steal, etc. I mean, that really is the issue. So often when you're, when you're witnessing to people, it, it's Usually, it's not that people don't believe in God. It's usually that they don't think they're going to get judged or they right. think that th they're okay, even though they've done a little sin. It's kind of okay. And so showing someone the law and showing someone that they're going to be judged by the law, that's, that's really the, the best thing we could do, right? Amen. Okay. Well, we're out of time. We did it. I did it. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> you're, okay, you're, we'll a, you're a talented editor. Yes. You're not an on-the-box man, but you did very well. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So... Until next time, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. Proclaim the gospel. You're full of it! Living Waters presents On the Box.